Good morning and welcome to this Christmas weekend and the final Sunday of 2020. A year that has been a year of waiting and in many ways, a year of lonely and weary waiting. This morning, we turn our eyes to the God who is with us in our waiting, even when we don't feel like it. The prophet Isaiah writes, why do you say my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Good morning, Red Cedar. Let's begin our time uh, singing and worship together to the God who is always on the throne, the Ancient of Days. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the Ancient of Days. All of creation, God for the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, and we shall bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power, even to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow for the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, and he shall bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O God. Shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days, for none shall compare to your matchless work. Sing to the ancient of days, every tongue in heaven and earth. Shall declare your glory, and he shall bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. O ancient of days. O ancient of days. time we read from the Jesus Storybook Bible, we learned about how God had put a bright star in the sky to tell the whole world about his son being born. This is the rest of the story. Well, the next part. It's called the King of All Kings. Far away in the east, three clever men saw the very same star, the star that God had put in the sky when Jesus was born. They knew it was a sign. A baby king had been born. They had been waiting for this star. They knew it would come. He's here, they shouted, he's here. And I am sure if you had been there, you would have heard them laughing and dancing and singing until the sun came up. At dawn, they packed up their camels and wrapped gifts for the baby. They brought their most precious treasures of all, frankincense, gold, and myrrh special, sparkly, lovely smelling, gleaming things, just right for a king. The three wise men, actually, if you'd met them, 
you would have thought they were kings because they were so rich and clever and important looking. The three wise men set off. They rode their camels across endless deserts, up steep, steep mountains, down into deep, deep valleys, through raging rivers over glass, grassy plains, night and day and day and night, for hours that turned into days, that turned into weeks, that turned into months and months, until at last they reached Jerusalem. Jerusalem was by far the most important city for miles around. And as anyone can tell you, that's where a palace would be and kings are born in palaces. So that's where they went, but they were in for a surprise. They went to see King Herod. Surely he'd know where this baby was, but he didn't. In fact, he didn't like the sound of a new king. It made him cross. He didn't want anyone to be king except him. But Herod's advisors told the three wise men what was written in their books, what God had said about the baby king. Go to Bethlehem. That's where you'll find him. Suddenly, the star they had seen in the east started moving again, showing them the way. So the three wise men followed the star out of the big city along the road into the little town of Bethlehem. They followed the star through the streets of Bethlehem, out of the nice part of town, through the not so nice part of town, into the really not nice at all part of town, down a little dirt track until it stopped right over a little house. But wait, it wasn't a palace and there weren't any guards or servants or flags or red carpets or trumpets or anything. Did they get it wrong? Or was this what God meant? Sure enough, in that little house, there sitting on his mother's knee, they found him the baby king. The three men knelt before the little king. They took off their rich royal turbans and gleaming golden crowns. They bowed their noble heads to the ground and gave him their sparkling treasures. The journey that had begun so many centuries before had led three wise men here to a little town, to a little house, to a little child to the king God had promised David all those years before. But this child was a new kind of king. Though he was the prince of heaven, he had become poor. Though he was the mighty God, he had become a helpless baby. This king hadn't come to be the boss. He had come to be a servant. Please pray with me. King Jesus, we praise you that you are the boss. You are the boss of the whole universe. But when you were born on earth, you came to serve. Thank you. Thank you for serving us by coming so that we could know you. Thank you for telling the shepherds and the wise men and us about your birth. While we separate, while we celebrate you, God, while we celebrate Christmas, King Jesus, would you help us to know you more and would you help us to love you better? We do love you. Amen. Let's continue worshiping together with this song of prayer. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, lead new life into my weary soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come Spirit, 
breathe new life in me. in all I do. Holy Spirit from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made. Show your power again on earth cause your church to hunger for your ways let the fragrance of our prayers arise lead us on the road of sacrifice that in unity the face of Christ will be clear the world to see. Pray with me this morning. Father, thank you that our way is not hidden from you. Thank you that you don't look away from us. Lord, we know what it's like to have people not pay attention to us. Thank you that you are not like that, but that you always pay attention. You're the creator of everything, and you have no beginning and no end. You are perfectly just. You don't let evil things go unpunished. You are perfectly true. Lord, we live in a world where it's hard to tell the difference between lies and truths and half lies and, and there's so much gray. But thank you that you are above the earth. You can cut through lies and truths. But thank you that you choose to be with us too by your spirit. So creator, and Father, we pray that you would give us power this morning by your Holy Spirit, and of course, only because of Jesus, only because of Jesus, because of our faith in him. We ask that you would give us power to do the work you have for us this week and this new year. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to see the neighbors that you would have us to love. Help us to see one another. Help us to carry the good news of Jesus to people whose souls are lost and separated from you. And help us to do it in a way that shows them your love. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, knowing that you will renew our strength and that we can mount up with wings like eagles and run and not be weary and walk and not faint. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading is from James 3, 13 through 18. Who was wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, 
there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom that comes from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Hello, Red Cedar, and thank you for once again accommodating these strange times with this completely online service. In fact, by the time uh, this is being viewed, I will actually be at a family reunion. Uh, the first time I'll have been home uh, for Christmas in probably about 40 years. And I thought that would be even a good context to set the stage for what I want to talk about as I sort of take a break from Exodus this Sunday. So I want you to imagine uh, a family reunion. And uh, in this case, uh, at our family reunion, one of the traditions that my own kids have come to expect is uh, the what they call grandpa's speech, when the sort of patriarch sits down and uh, talks about his appreciation of the family, maybe a, maybe a story or two. So imagine that same situation, but instead of uh, a family reunion, how about a whole nation reunion? How about the, a patriarch of an entire nation sitting down to tell this brand new generation of people the history of their family? The story specifically, of how their family started. Imagine that you're there, you're listening, you've got your children there, you're kind of excited about, uh, you know, grandpa so-and-so telling uh, the story of how the family got started. And within a matter of moments, you realize this is totally out of control. It's awful. It, it's get the kids out of the room kind of story. Because as it turns out, as, as he's telling the story, it becomes very sexually explicit. And as he's telling the story of how the family got started, it becomes violent. And not just violent like an action-adventure violence, but violence like the kind of horror movies that ought never to have been made to begin with. In fact, it's so bad that you either want to live in denial of your family history or change your last name. Well, it turns out that's actually the story of the book of Judges, of how the early Israelite family got started. Here they were, the rescued people out of Egypt, the, the persevering people that had, that had survived a whole generation who suffered from unbelief and a whole new generation had come up and persevered, uh, a generation that was actually in the promised land. But there was a problem in the promised land. Just one little problem called the Canaanites. The Canaanites were humanity at, at its worst. Generation after generation, they had been distancing themselves from God, slowly shutting off what little image of God was in them, shutting off their conscience, till finally they were so far from God, they were, they were virtually without a human conscience. And so Israel was militarized by God to wipe them out. They had to wipe them out so that the people of God would grow, so that the people of God would become brighter and brighter, a radiating, attractive people that would draw all the rest of the nations on earth to the promised land, and more specifically, to the one who gave them the promised land, to the only true God overall. But it's not what happened. The story Grandpa is telling of how the family got started, it's a tragedy. The Canaanites were not removed, and within just a few generations, you couldn't tell the difference between the Israelites and the Canaanites. So where are we going with all of this this morning? Why bring this up? If I kind of simultaneously start a series on Judges while we work through Exodus? No. Over this past year, for me, it has been a remarkable time in my almost 40 years now of ministry. I've been through lots of individual trials. I've seen other people go through some pretty awful individual trials, but I have never witnessed an entire community, in fact, 
an entire global community going through a common trial. Never in my life have I experienced anything like this. And we're told from the book of James that trials reveal and refine. Or maybe an even better way to say it is, uh, these trials reveal in order to define. And what this trial has revealed in my mind is what I'm going to call, <coughs> excuse me, to quote an old classic movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. There, there's been a lot of good. I have seen our congregation in particular hold on to each other particularly through our small group ministry. It's, it's as though we're all kind of battling, you know, a fierce wind and people are holding on to each other. They're connecting with one another. I've seen people persevering. I've seen and heard of pastors and missionaries all around the country, perse world, persevering under some of just, just exhausting circumstances when it would be so tempting to just say, okay, I'm done. That's the good. There's been some bad. Uh, lots of stories of people just passively drifting away with the normal things that keep them attached to Jesus and to the church are just not there. And so uh, it's a lot harder to stay attached to Jesus. So they've just been passively drifting away. But I mostly want to talk today about the ugly. There is, a, there is one respect in which the church has been much like Israelites, the Israelites in the book of Judges. You cannot tell the difference between the church and the Canaanites. Let me give you just a few examples. When it comes to our view of COVID and of government, we are much more influenced, generally speaking, by the Canaanites than we are by Christ on those views. Our country has been polarized on the race issue and on politics and the church is just as polarized. The arrogance and the independence that have made humble conversations impossible seem to be just as bad in the church as outside of the church. There is a phrase, it's a theme to the book of Judges. It occurs four times in the book, and in fact, the very last verse of the book of Judges has this phrase, it is this, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I have said before uh, that uh, we're going through these different kinds of phases as a culture. Secularism, and this is an oversimplification, but secularism says there's no, there's no truth with a capital T, there's just my truth. Consumerism says there's no time for truth. And tribalism, which is the newest version of this, tribalism says there's no gray, there's just my truth. It's all black and it's all white. And I would say that secularism was the biggest problem for my parents' generation, consumerism was the biggest problem for my generation, and tribalism is the biggest problem for the generation behind me. And tribalism is becoming greater and greater. There, all of these isms are shouting out to us like the book of Judges saying, we need a king. We need a godly authority to reign over us. Now, unlike the book of Judges, where it ends with just a, a whisper of hope that a king may be coming to help them out, our reality is that the king has already come. And we don't have to wait for him to reign. He's already reigning. So despite the ugly that we see, the good is actually winning. But, and this is super important of what, I'm, what I want to share this morning. Even though the good is ultimately winning because our king is reigning, there are ups and downs in the reign of that king. There are ups and downs in terms of how much the ugly is dominating his people. And right now, I would argue we are in a down cycle. And this pandemic and 2020 has confirmed that all the more for me. And I believe our king is ordering us to clean out the Canaanites. And if I can put it more specifically, what we're gonna talk about today, is to weaponize our hearts 
with biblical wisdom. That's all I want to do today. I want to give you a, a definition of biblical wisdom and just a couple comments on a few basics on how to acquire it. The elders and I have been talking about this for quite some time now. Over the next several years, we want to make this a prominent theme. The importance of becoming biblically wise people in a world that's becoming noisier and noisier and darker and darker. So let me pray for us and then let's look at a passage. Our Father, thank you for those who are listening today. Give them the ability to uh, hang in there, to listen, to pay attention. Give me the ability to say some things with clarity. Do all of this so that Christ himself would be more radiant and gorgeous to us, that we might be drawn to him, so that we might reflect him to a world that desperately needs to see him. And we pray in his great name. Amen. So let's look at this idea of a definition of biblical wisdom from James chapter 3, the passage you heard read, uh, a very familiar passage maybe to some of you. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And when I say I want to give a definition of biblical wisdom, what I mean by that is uh, I'm not going to give the definition. Hopefully what's going to happen in the months and couple of years to come, you're going to hear us talk about biblical wisdom from multiple angles. So you're not just going to have one simple definition. You're going to have multiple definitions so they can have a more robust picture of what biblical wisdom is. And certainly this passage here in the book of James, in fact, we could argue the whole book of James is about, James is about biblical wisdom, but specifically he identifies it here in these few verses, a little bit of the context. James was a little letter written by probably Jesus's brother, James, uh, to multiple churches. So it was meant to be copied and spread around. The context in the churches of the time was that there were a lot of people with, with strong, untested opinions, and everyone was acting like a judge and a teacher. And, uh, and when you come to, to chapters three and four, where this passage is in the middle, right, right in the middle of this is a description of wisdom. Right before this, in James chapter three, verses one through 12, we have a, we have a, a passage about the destructive power of the tongue, the destructive power of the tongue. And it's, it's, a, it's a passage that talks about the destructive power of the tongue as a theory, and it gives several illustrations. Right after the passage we're going to look at today, we see the destructive power of the tongue in actuality. So in other words, between these two passages on the destructive power of the tongue, one in theory and one in what's actually happening, James says the solution is biblical wisdom in verses 13 through 18. So listen to the, and he does this by contrasting biblical wisdom with demonic wisdom. Biblical wisdom with demonic wisdom. And notice here in verse 14 and 16, when he speaks about demonic wisdom, he says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast, do not boast and be false to the truth. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every evil practice. He, and he says in verse 15, this isn't the wisdom that comes down from above. It's earthly, it's unspiritual, it's demonic. One of the things I find so interesting about this passage, whether we're talking about uh, the wisdom, the demonic wisdom or the wisdom from above, is that there's less of an actual definition and more a list of results, more a list of results. And I'm reminded that uh, when the Pharisees came up to Jesus one time in Matthew 11, they were uh, rejecting that John, they were rejecting John the Baptist as a prophet from God because of his weird lifestyle. And then strangely enough, they rejected Jesus as a prophet from God because of his normal lifestyle. And Jesus sort of throws it back at them and he makes this interesting statement. He says, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. In Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, he says, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. In other words, you may not be able to define wisdom, 
but you can detect it by how people operate, by how they behave. And that's, I think, what James is saying here. Is, let me describe to you, he says, not so much a classic dictionary kind of definition, but let me describe to you what biblical wisdom looks like in the real world compared to what demonic wisdom looks like. So let's look at this description of demonic wisdom primarily by two terms, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Bitter jealousy is anger at not getting what you know you deserve. And selfish ambition is a phrase actually used by Aristotle, uh, the same Greek word that James uses here. And it's, the, it's what Aristotle described as the uh, the ambition of people seeking political office by unfair means. So we would say it's the kind of self-seeking that rationalizes any means to get what a person wants. And in fact, when you read in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, you start to get an, uh, an example of what this was looking like in the church. James says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions, these desires you have, are at war within you? Does you desire something, and because you're not getting it, because you don't have it, you're actually murdering one another. He says you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So it's this sort of murderousness uh, it's a strong word that James uses, and he doesn't apologize for it. He's not speaking like, like over the top. What he's really saying here is that we have these natural desires. In fact, sometimes we even have these good desires. And when these desires aren't met, and we think we're so entitled to them, we start then, they turn from desires to demands. They rule us. And these demands wind up causing us to judge other people because they're not meeting our demands. And when these people are uh, not meeting our demands, after we judge them, we start punishing them. Thus quarrels and conflicts and all these other things break out. Let me just say this too, that I think there's some respectable versions of selfish ambition and bitter jealousy that leads to this kind of disorder that characterizes um, our society and also spills into the church. And so some of those respectable um, versions of this are passive aggressive behavior. Uh, this is when you're nice to people, but you express the frustration uh, about those people to other people or the fear of offending people. Sometimes we see something in someone's life, we suspect something in their life and we probably wonder, maybe, maybe I should talk to them about it. It's gonna be uncomfortable, I'll probably offend them, but maybe out of kindness I should talk to them about it. But then we wind up talking ourselves uh, out of that. And uh, another uh, version of this is when you're, you're unaware that you're unapproachable. You're unaware that you're unapproachable. Uh, you're clueless at how people experience you. Uh, and so, uh, it's the kind of person, for example, who's so convinced they're right, they never actually engage in dialogue, but only monologue. Or it's the kind of person that you're walking on eggshells all the time because they get so defensive and they're so easily offended. But the wisdom from above is something entirely different. The wisdom from above is uh, described here in uh, James chapter three, as something that's very unnatural, very out of place, which is why Jesus doesn't ever fit neatly in any one particular group in the New Testament. He doesn't fit with the Pharisees. He doesn't fit with the Sadducees, even his own disciples. He keeps getting out of their categories that they want to place him in over and over again. Notice the first thing, verse 17 of James 3, biblical wisdom is from above. In other words, it's a source outside of ourselves. And then, this is really important, the word first, it says in verse 17. It's from above and it's first pure. In other words, if there's one descriptor that colors every other description that comes in verse 17, it is this, purity. It's pure. It's the above quality. In other words, this kind of wisdom is not only from a source outside of ourselves, above, 
but it's also from a source that's not polluted with self-exaltation. It is a, it is a wisdom that has a God-exalting aim that dominates the way we process information and the way we process people. In fact, if you read these descriptors here in verse 17, it's peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. They're very overlapping. Uh, they're not necessarily all distinct. They very much overlap. And if there's one word that grabs all of these words, it's found in verse 13, and it is the word meekness. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Meekness, I love this description of meekness. Strength that accommodates itself to another person's weaknesses. So instead of disorder, biblical wisdom produces, verse 18, peace where there's the prolonged presence of biblical wisdom, peace prevails over disorder. If I can put it this way, verse 13 basically says, biblical wisdom, this meekness, this humility that characterizes biblical wisdom, it shows up in our disposition rather than showing off in our discussions. Biblical wisdom shows up at our disposition rather than showing off in our discussions. That's why James says it's quick to hear, it's slow to speak. That's why the book of Proverbs says, a fool is wise in his own eyes, but biblical wisdom, says Proverbs, welcomes correction. Biblical wisdom treasures the abundance of many counselors, not just one or two counselors. In 1 Corinthians 8, where knowledge puffs up, biblical wisdom is ruled by the fear of the Lord. Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, which means that when biblical wisdom is reigning in us, it means that everything we're learning by both information and experience is aimed at hallowing God's name. Colossians chapter two actually says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. So to wrap it all up, I'd say this biblical wisdom is nothing less than the skill of beholding Christ in order to become more like Christ. So just a word or two on how to acquire it. Just, just an introduction, that's all this is. You'll be hearing a lot more about this in time to come. And, and in order to, to show you that, turn to Proverbs 2. Proverbs chapter two, this is the first couple of verses. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And it starts off with these simple words, very familiar words in the book of Proverbs. My son, my son. The whole book of Proverbs is one generation passing on the wisdom to another generation. It's, it would be easy to skip right by this, but the first practical step toward acquiring wisdom is to realize it's a community project. It's a community project. So think for a moment of your small group or any kind of group of Christian friends that you know. How would you characterize your small group? Is your small group primarily about just kicking back and enjoying some friendships and, and just being unplugged from the craziness of this world? If so, thank the Lord for that. I, I hope that's at the very least what your small groups are. But should a small group be more than that? Maybe a small group should be more like an AA meeting where, we're constant, where there's constant attention to fighting the dangers that we know we're vulnerable to at all times. In fact, better still than that, you've heard me say this before, I think our small groups to some degree must be more like a boot camp where we're, where we're seriously focusing on what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. And the reason I say that is, listen to the rest of Proverbs 2 here. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments, receive and treasure, they both mean the same thing here. And, and the idea is that it should be something, biblical wisdom should be something that you want, not something that you have to get. It's something that you want. 
Secondly, it says in verse 2, make your ear attentive, incline your heart to understanding. In other words, fight the gravitational pull to passivity. So the first thing we got to do is, is determine how to, how to make and incline our hearts. This be, the very first part of basic training here in this boot camp is, is, a, is deciding to sit down and say, 2021 is going to start, and I'm going to get deadly serious about pursuing biblical wisdom. It goes on. Each verse increases in intensity. Verse 3, call out for wisdom. Raise your voice for wisdom. So it's not only about you've got to want this. You've got to be determined to fight the gravitational pull to passivity. But you've also got to pray for a passion for this as well. And then finally, verse 4, seek it like silver. Search for it like hidden treasure. How do people seek for silver? Oftentimes we talk about people being greedy. Proverbs essentially says you need to be greedy for wisdom. You need to have an intensity for that. So in 2021, this is what's going to happen. We are going to seed the congregation, kind of like you seed clouds to get snow to come. Uh, we are going to seed the congregation through a few tweaks to our worship service starting this next year. Uh, by adding a couple more uh, things like workshops and book clubs as a way to kind of seed the whole congregation with biblical wisdom. But we're also going to be looking for a few people who want to be part of a serious biblical wisdom apprenticeship, who don't just want to read and study Proverbs chapter 2 and James chapter 3, but they want to experience it at such a level of intensity that they cannot help and, in fact, must pass it on to others. So if you're interested in that, talk to me. Let's pray. Our Father, I am thankful that we're not left in the dark, that you have given us this word, the Bible, and the whole community of Christ that stretches past through, through all of history. But oh, hear our confession of all the noise, all the distraction, all the independence, all the way the Canaanite culture is drowning out the voice of Jesus. And help us begin in this next year to make a difference and to become biblically wise so that we might behold Christ in order to become more like Christ. We pray in his great name, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of His great name. Exalt on bended knee. Praise God, the Holy Trinity. Praise God. Sings flow, 
Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all of ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So wherever you find yourself at this morning, may him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said, amen.